Grab your beverages and turn up your interweb. Solving the world's problems 12 ounces at a time. It's Dudes and Beer. Well, hello everybody and welcome, welcome, welcome to this special Monday night edition, this holiday edition of Dudes and Beer. We are doing it on Monday night because, well, I myself, the host, am actually leaving tomorrow for uh, my trip to Boston with my good family, uh, Amy Jordan, uh, my wife of the Yes But Why podcast, and my son Dalvis are going to visit family in Boston for the holidays. And Julie, our, our great PR person, is heading out to New York. Yes. For Broadway, I'm so excited. Broadway, you know, what's that all about? It's going to be crazy. Fancy life. Yeah, yeah. And uh, on the phone with us this evening, uh, Stephen will be here soon. He's out making the money on a Monday night. Uh, Hopefully right now everybody is tuned in over at uh, Austin's Pizza uh, while, while he is closing up shop and getting ready to head over here. But our special guest this evening in episode 141, is Charlie Mars. Uh, Charlie Mars is a Mississippi transplant who uh, came to Austin and now returns to the Austin scene regularly, tours the United States, plays with people like Jimmy Buffett, opens for people like the Dixie Chicks. Uh, We're going to be talking about his upcoming album, Beach Town, as well as his album, Like a Bird, Like a Plane. Uh, With us this evening is Charlie Mars. How are you doing, Charlie? Hey, how's it going? Fantastic. Hey, Were you able to hear the intro on your end? I heard the intro. Fantastic. I am, I am so happy. I am so happy. Uh, so, yeah, Charlie, uh, as we start out this evening, why don't you go ahead and tell our audience a little bit about yourself, uh, where you come from, how you came to play music, and how you came to Austin. Well, I come from uh, Laurel, Mississippi, which is where I grew up, and I have uh, two brothers, and my mom, dad, and I, and we all live in, in Laurel, um, which is in central Mississippi. It's close to Hattiesburg and Meridian, and you probably go through there if you ever are driving across country, but um, yep. I lived there for 17 years, and it was a wonderful place to grow up. It was a in fact, there's a TV show now on HGTV called My Hometown yep. that is hosted by a couple named Aaron and Ben, or Ben and Aaron Napier, and uh, it's all it's based in Laurel. Oh wow, really? Well. Yeah, I went and visited there recently, and it's it's just still a, 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 an idyllic small southern town that was um, kind of rooted in the in the in forestry and in, in, in pine and the town had a lot of money at one point and so there's a lot of beautiful homes and it's a beautiful museum and it really has an infrastructure that you just don't see in, um, in that many communities so it was an interesting place to grow up and yeah I had a very um, in a lot of ways I had a very idyllic idyllic life there a lot of, a lot of playing in the woods and you know, taking piano lessons and skateboarding and playing baseball and <laughs> total all American. Yeah, it was pretty. It was. It was pretty all American. And then from there, I um, moved to Jackson, Mississippi, uh, my senior year of high school. And then from there, I went to Dallas, Texas, and went to college at Southern Methodist University for oh, four wow. years and studied studied English. And I kind of went there as I as I'm prone to do. On a, I went there impulsively, <laughs> uh, all right, without re- without really knowing anybody or knowing what I was getting myself into. Sure. And and um, while I was there, I met Jack Ingram um, when I was 18 years old. And Jack was just starting out um, as a as a you know singing and writing his own songs and playing cover songs. Yeah. And he, he was gracious enough to not only have me play with him, but introduce me to a lot of his friends. And that sort of set my trajectory for my social life there. And also, he was kind of the, 
a person who showed me that I could I could make my own album, you know, because he did it, and and I just it was the first time I really seriously considered recording my own music outside of what I had done with a band in high school. And and when was that? Like around what year, Charlie? Nineteen ninety two. Okay, okay. So you're you're right up around my age then. So you were you were probably doing things on like analog Tascam four track that kind of stuff. Yeah, my first record we saw it on two inch. Oh wow, wow. Um, yeah, I did several. I did three albums. I've done four albums on two inch. Wow. Um, and on two inch tape. And so uh, I, when I was a senior in college, I made my first album. I didn't have any sort of expectations. I just hoped that it would do do well, do well, and you know, I didn't really have any expectations. And at that time, there was very much a, a trajectory where you could put up, release music and then you could tour on a college circuit, play fraternity parties, and play in college towns. And it was kind of indicative of how Dave Matthews and Big Head Todd and the Monsters and bands like that. All yeah, that Fish, board. all that stuff. This, the Horde tour, and yep. there was a, comp a compilation CD that they used to put out called Aware, and there was a very much just kind of a grassroots, college-oriented music scene that, that I kind of plugged myself into because my, my album did well and it caught on on some college campuses, and, you know, a year later I was doing well enough to where I could support myself and and so I decided to make a, a go of it and um, I had a management company that was interested in me in Atlanta and so I moved to Atlanta with um, three guys that um, I had gone to college with and we started touring full time and that was uh, where I based myself out of for for about three or four years, and then I also moved to Athens, Georgia, around that time. And that was kind of where, you know, I learned how to front a band and to play shows and to, to manage my career somewhat. And it was also where I made a lot of mistakes and learned the pitfalls of those, those mistakes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, some al alcohol uh, issues and prescription pill addiction and rehab and you know everything was the booze and, and was free and, and and the pizza and that was about it and yeah so, um but I, I i went through a lot early and i got a lot of things you know behind me relatively early on in my career even though i had been touring for seven years uh, I got a lot, a lot of those things out of my system, and 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 so that was very very much a kind of, you know, I was in the forest, and I hadn't really really made it out yet. And then I moved back to Mississippi um, after living in Athens, Georgia, for a while, and I went to rehab and sort of got my life together and wanted to be close to home for that. And um, I, I, my brother was in college. At, at the University of Mississippi in Oxford, Mississippi, and I went to visit him. And when I was there, it had been a while since I had had like any female attention from anybody. I had been kind of in my own world for a while. <laughs> I hooked up with this really pretty girl, and I was, I was like, I'm moving here to Oxford, Mississippi. This is nice. And so a week later, I had an apartment there, and wow. I wound up living there for 17, 17 years. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So it and worked I, out. I, I mean, I, not with the girl necessarily, but with the city. Yeah, Oxford was very good to me, and it, it gave me a, a sanctuary to, um, to sort of pull my life together. And I had a community of friends there that I respected and appreciated. Yeah. And, and it was a it's a creative and cultural center within Mississippi, and there's several, but yeah. it's one of them. And uh, it, it, it was a place where I kind of regrouped, and then I, I um... Well, and, uh, like, uh, uh, 
I, yeah. I, I had very much a, a similar story whenever I moved to Portland, Maine. Like, I, I moved to Portland, Maine to get away from bad influences I had in my life in Houston, stuff like that. And uh, it, it took a while to clean up my system and, and do things properly in life. And once I got to that point, um, I was so much happier and so much prouder of not only myself, but the, the work that I put out. Uh, is that something that you've found uh, through your journey musically, Charlie? Well, I think the thing about music for me has always been that it came from an honest place. Yeah. And it did that. And that, that was the case because, for whatever reason, I just wasn't a very open person. And music was a door to what was going on inside of me you know, always. And so, no matter if I've been in a really dark place or a really uh, 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 the opposite of that, I've always expressed myself through music in an honest way and, and if you're expressing yourself emotionally honestly it's a spiritual expression and yes I think that's why I stuck with I stuck with it for so many years and there's certainly been times when I could have let it go and, and, and maybe moved on to, to something a little a little with a little less um insecurity and risk and uh, you know it's not a very safe life and it's just it's always um it's always a struggle. At least it always has been. You know, it's just it's just you're traveling all the time, and it's hard to have solid relationships. That are yeah, yeah it's, sure. it's 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 hard to make roots and and really get to know people and build a support network as an individual. Um, unless, like yeah. you, unless like you said earlier, you you go back home. Um, you know. Yeah, yeah, and I did that, and, 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 and but music has always been a vehicle for honesty for me. Yeah, and my the way I the way I've lived my life has not been, and so I always <laughs> held on to that, like I clung on to that life raft as as a way of um, finding truth. Yeah, and, and so so the whole time I, I feel I've always felt. Um, that I had integrity in my music, and, I, and, and, and because it's very easy to, to, to make sure that you, you, you do that, whereas life is much harder. <laughs> yes, yes it is, and I mean, mm -hmm. I, I myself mm -hmm. uh, have, have always said that I've had problems as, as not only a poet but a musician writing outside of my own experience. Uh, I, I can't, like, I can write a great monologue, um, <laughs> but I cannot write with the voice of somebody else. Uh, and that's, a, that's just my own hang up. Like I know people that can, that can write anything esoteric in the world when it comes to music. But for some reason, when I write music, even when it's my instrumental music, um, it's, it's definitely like a representation fully of what is going on in my brain at that present moment. Yeah, yeah, and I'm kind of the same way. I, Steve Earle told me once that I just wrote about myself, and he's pretty much right. Um, but I don't write about myself in order to. I write about myself so that I can connect what I have going on with me with other people, and and that's what makes me feel connected. Yeah, more alive and less isolated. And, yeah, um, and that's the beauty of it. So were you remodeling when you wrote Dream Kitchen? <laughs> well, I wrote Dream Kitchen when I was, um, I think one of the things that having stayed with music as long as I have and done it independently and survived the collapse of the music industry and we're sort of on the other side of that to some degree now, I've always, um, you know, I always had ambitions to be able to have a family and, and to provide for them and to get nice things and to have nice things just because it's fun to have a life. Sure. Mm -hmm. you, have, you have those things. And and I think that that song really is about that that struggle to what, of not having, to, being able to do that and, and really wanting to, but to, to get... There was, you know, the song is because I had a girl in my life, and one of her things that she kept her going, and that she 
you know, dreamed about, almost like a girl dreams about a wedding day, whatever it was, that she would have her dream kitchen one day. And I wrote it in frustration because I couldn't get it. And I, the only dream kitchen that I could get was the song. Aww. Yeah. Yeah, well, and on on that note, let's listen to the first little bit of the second track. It is a good song. Uh, it's, it's supposed to make you happy. It's not, it's, not, it's not supposed to be a Debbie Downer or yeah. anything, but the underlying thing is just simply that, hey, what guy doesn't want to get the girl he loves what she wants? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, we, we all want to do that. We all want to provide the person that we love with everything that we possibly can. Um, everything under the sun within our power. And as we discuss that, let's listen to the first little bit of the second track of the new album that will be released soon, uh, Beach Town from Charlie Mars. This track is called Dream Kitchen. One three months later, I rang in the trailer. You know when you know it's right. I came home Friday, she was looking my way, and she looked a little uptight. Running everywhere, pulling out her hair, cause you know when something ain't right. She don't want no high heels, she wants that dream kitchen. I blame it all on that magazine subscription. What do you Living, oh, I can't stand to see that look in their eyes. I'm on a buy drink kitchen. Out goes drinking, out goes fishing, out goes Friday night. I was working overtime and saving every dime, cause you know when something ain't right. She don't want no high heels, she wants that dream kitchen. Subscription, what do I know about Southern living? Oh, I can't stand to see that look in their eyes. I'm on a buy drink kitchen. And that, that is about uh, just some of the most fun, down, down and dirty uh, grooving that you can get when it comes to playing music. Uh, like you said, the, the inspiration for that was, of course, your girlfriend wanting wanting a new kitchen and you not being able to provide it. But uh, what what went into the creation of that track for the album, Charlie? Uh, how long did it take in the studio? Uh, who were you working with? All that kind of stuff. I recorded that track in Austin with the drummer J.J. Johnson and um, the late George Reef on bass. Oh, wow. And I played acoustic guitar, and then we had a Nashville uh, player named, um, oh my gosh, if you hadn't have asked me, I would just, I, would, I, 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 <laughs> I am the monkey wrench in people's yeah, brains, oh God, bro. Jason Mallory is his name, and he's an amazing dobro player, and he really brought the heat on that. Yeah, and yeah. So, uh, yeah, we did that uh, here in Austin. We had a producer uh, named Dwight Baker, and he's also in a band called uh, The Wind and the Wave. And we had we cut it pretty quickly, and um, we spent some time on it. That was one that I, really, I just was really felt like we got right. It had such yeah. a great tempo, and I had been playing it for a while and really knew what I wanted. So, And that's, you know, probably, and it also just has such a country it's so country uh, as much oh, country yeah, as no, ever, it, ever, ever yeah, done. It is, uh, it is, it is straight down, dirty chicken picking country. Like, no and, and that's, that's definitely, I, I would like that to kind of lead into, um, how, cause I could totally see that song opening for somebody like the Dixie Chicks or even be covered by somebody like the Dixie Chicks. How is it that you came to work with the Dixie Chicks, open for them? And what was that experience like for you, Charlie? Well, um, uh, I got to know them because they were, they let me know that they were fans of my album, Like a Bird, Like a Plane. And then we just, 
became friendly, and then uh, they're in South by Southwest one year. Marty and Emily had a band called the Courtyard Hounds, and they were doing um, broadcasts online, but having different people that were at the festival come in and 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 play with them. And that was the first time that we really got to play together, and we did a song called Nothing But the Rain. And then just over time, I would, I, we just became more and more friendly. And then they, they had a tour in Canada that was about 15 shows. And they hadn't really toured together in 10 years. And they asked me to be the opening act. And I was surprised and grateful. And, and the experience ended up being, um, it was a real eye opener for me because a lot of my show is about storytelling and humor, and um, and I think that I have a, a I don't know a unique voice when I'm when I'm doing that, and I have only really exercised that in in coffee house and small club environments. So to walk out in front of forty and fifty thousand people by yourself, it's gotta be you don't know what's gonna happen. Yeah. And so what I realized in that tour is that, and you see this if you've ever seen a comedian do a stadium like Chris Rock. Yeah. If you have a good story and you have a you have something to say and it's compelling and it's funny or fun and people can get inv- invested in it, it really doesn't matter if it's a coffee shop or a stadium. And That's I very absolutely quickly true. realized that everything that I was doing was working in the stadium just as well as it works now. You need a captive audience. Unfortunately, those Canadians were 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 really respectful, and 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 they were listening. And you know, an American audience typically the opening act you can get drowned out. But I have yeah. a yeah, captive I can see audience, that. And so and so I was able to the first show from the first show. The first show, I was very nervous and I didn't know what was going to happen. And it was yeah. okay, but it wasn't great. But by the end. I felt like I had a new skill set, and I realized that what I was doing could work not only in a coffee shop, but in stadiums, and it, it gave me a confidence that, that I'd never had, which is that that I could go out in front of 40,000 people and deliver, and it, it really uh, gave me a sense of, of self-confidence and, and, and that, that, that I, I didn't have. I had confidence, but that really cemented you know, I knew that I was capable of doing something that, that not many people are capable of doing. Yeah, and, uh, you know, uh, do me a favor, Charlie. I think we're kind of fading in and out a little bit. Uh, just keep that phone hugged right up against your face, microphone close to your mouth for me as you as you speak. Okay, you uh, <laughs> just to make sure you're coming in all the way for our audience. But, yeah, and, I mean, it's it's a hard transition. As, as somebody who worked in small club environments with singer-songwriters, with small bands— uh, that went out and played the festival circuit, that kind of stuff. Um, that transition from going from like, you know, uh, like you said, a coffee shop of 30 people to even a venue of 150 people. And then 40, um, <laughs> And then suddenly you go in front of like even 3,500 people, much less 40,000. Um, you know, does that material translate? And uh, it is not always the case, but your your music and the stories behind them have such energy that uh, it's it's hard for them not to translate from what I can see. And Julie is the person that actually turned me on to you years ago. You came and uh, played a backyard party at her place. And I was yeah, not I able to make that. it, but I started looking you up at that point. And it was like, oh, wow, this is really great stuff. Um, it's so well produced and so well thought out musically. Um, it's it's like you really, really take the time to properly craft a song. Um, and how the intros, long, too. Like, the yeah. whole thing is just such an experience. Uh, what, how, how do you go about... Um, writing a song typically like I'm I'm someone that whenever I'm writing lyric music I have to have the music first it's hard for me uh, to write music after I write lyric what is your typical process whenever you're writing Charlie if I'm writing for I, I, I collaborate uh, when I write a lot of songs now I write with other people and that 
that's a different process. That's a little bit more like you show up and go to work. But when I'm writing for, for myself, it's generally just a very organic thing. It's almost like a stream of consciousness. And then once I find, I stumble upon something that registers with me, I try to, I spend a lot of time developing it and crafting it. And, and uh, you know, I'll get a good verse or a good chorus. And yeah, yeah. sometimes it comes together quickly and sometimes it comes together over the course of a long period of time. Um, but it generally tends to come initially from a similar thing as um, like I'm not even there and I just happen to be the person that grabs this thing out of the ether. Sure. Like you were just a vessel for it? It, it, it feels egoless. Yeah. Yeah. And then once once you get those little diamonds, it or you have to use your skill set to, to, to carve it out. And that skill set is just something that is constantly evolving. Yeah, yeah. And it just, it, like, for me, um, I've found it very hard in the last probably five years of my life to write lyric music. Um, for some reason, the, the words just don't come as easy as the music does anymore. Um, have you ever run across that in your career? Have you ever come across any stumbling blocks like that where you just hit a point that, uh, you know, you've kind of hit a writing brick wall for a little while? How does, how does that work for you? I've never had any point where I was stressed out about it. I mean, if I'm not feeling it, I usually just don't worry about it and move on to something else. And, but when I collaborate with someone, it's definitely more like we're going to get this and we just have to stay with it until the energy comes back. Yeah. And that's often the case. You know, you might catch a good verse and a chorus and then you might spend four hours screwing around and then you stumble upon another line that works. And so yeah. I, there's no, first of all, uh, if you're having a, a trouble you just put the pen to paper and start going and if you go 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 eventually you'll find you'll stumble upon a, an energy that feels like something valuable is going on but i don't tend to do that in my if i'm writing alone i tend to either feel like i'm into it and i'm inspired and something's moving me in a direction or i'm at least having fun and if I stop having fun and I'm not feeling it, then I just quit. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I do it every day because it's my passion and I love it. And so I don't ever stress out about new stuff happening because it has always happened. Right. And yeah. so I don't really uh, think about it anymore. And I, I mean, I've made, I think I've made eight or eight or nine albums. And so if I ran, if I didn't feel like I had more to do, I really would be okay. I would, I don't think I would care. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, no. I mean, you've, you've had a good body of work as it is right now, you know, and it, it, it actually shows a great progression as a musician, um, from the first to the last. Uh, it's a, it's a great, uh, growth process that you can hear. It's a great, um, process of writing that you can hear and the growth in depth. Um, what is it like for you as an artist to bring your stuff onto the stage and bring it to other people as personal as it is? Uh, it's just a very, it's an experience that I'm grateful to have had to have in my life. And it's, 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 it's really nice when you're someone who's maybe typically a loner type person to be able to connect in such a communal way. And I'm a little, a little bitch for attention too. So, <laughs> attention, but, so that I feel like I'm not going to, I don't know. It's probably got something to do with my mortality. That I don't uh, understand. Uh, uh, I know I'm very few human humans say. that don't enjoy a good ego boost. Yeah, totally. I love attention. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean that's nice too. <laughs> well, and uh, you know, with 
with that in mind, uh, especially things that we've talked about already, I would like to take a little hop in the Wayback Machine for this second track and okay. go go back to your album, Like a Bird, Like a Plane. Um, mm-hmm. Where were you when, personally when you started writing that album, when that album came to be, and especially uh, track five, which is pretty much square in the middle of the album, uh, listen to the dark side. Why Why is that track in specific uh, in the middle of the album? What does that track mean to you before we listen to it? Well, that album I made after I had been on a major label and I was on V2 Records and I had very high hopes to, you know, to make it to a, like a new level in my career. Sure. And I did that to some degree, but by and large, it was a um, it it was a commercial uh, failure. All right. So I, uh, I it wasn't an artistic failure, but very few records on major labels, you know, sell very much. So yeah, really yeah, it takes kind of it takes a lot, a lot for something to hit charts and uh, to to continuously go into production and sell. And so I was pretty down, and I I knew that um, that was when I learned that people in the music business that I thought were my friends were not, and that I was naive, and and that I was paying a price for that naivete. And that was when I decided that I wouldn't be doing that again as far as um, not being able to control my own destiny. Yes. And I felt I felt as though unless I had a really strong representation of something that was going to work and that was a next level of creativity that really woke people up to what I was doing that I was probably not going to make it much further. And so I felt that that kind of um a kind of a combination of a, a wanting to prove myself and also uh, scared that I wasn't going to be able to keep going and not knowing what I was going to do, and I was broke. And I just sort of put all the pieces together. And But I've, I've always been a songwriter, and I've always been writing. And so that batch of songs, um, I was happy to, 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 with them and was, in, was inspired by them. And then sonically, it was ushered in an era where I really began to focus on the groove aspect of all the music. And I've always focused on that because I don't like music for myself. That's really straight. That has, yeah. that doesn't have like, much hip to it. Yep. And I never wanted, I never wanted to make music again that didn't have an element of a groove and often experimental grooves unless uh, uh, I never, that was a huge part of the emphasis. And so I don't know why the hell listen to the dark side of number five on the record, but (laughs) the song itself uh, is indicative of the message of a lot of my songs, which is um, that, that the things that have gotten me through life have been the big ticket, simple, they're not simple, but they're big, they're of the earth, which is friendship and the simplicity of being able to be with a friend and enjoy listening to music and smoking some weed and, and how many times in my life when I was in a rough spot, that, that, that connection with friends is something that has gotten me through. Yes, and that's absolutely. That's really the, es- the essence of the song. Yeah. Well, let's take a listen to the first little bit of uh, Listen to the Dark Side from the album Like a Bird, Like a Plane by Charlie Mars. This is track five, Listen to the Dark Side. He said, I know you're a good girl, 
He's not out to hurt nobody. He's just trying to get, trying to get in your head. Oh, if you wanna come, if you wanna come over, come over and get out. We can listen to the dark side. Again, I think you hold your heart too close to the vest. I know you're a good man. You're not after nobody. She's just trying to get, trying to get in your head. Oh, if you wanna come, if you wanna come over, come over and get high. We can listen to the dark side. I'm sorry, I let that go a little bit long because I just love that turnaround in the middle of the song. It is absolutely addictive, Charlie. Uh, and it, that, sh that song, I think, really, really, um, in comparison to Dream Kitchen, um, shows the real reach and breadth of not only your talent, but the, the concept that you have for your music. And it's the fact of it's, it's just something that moves you. Um, it's, it, it, I, I've yet to find anything that is, um, other than the sound and your voice, uh, definable of Charlie Mars. It's so entirely hard to put you into a category and to pigeonhole you as a description. Uh, how, how do you, uh, go about maintaining that like I, I know I've written hundreds of songs over the years but uh, it's hard for them after a while not to be repetitive not to uh, be so entirely um, like I was saying earlier so so blatantly about self how is it that you go about maintaining um, a distance yet still um, talking about something as common as, do you want to come over and get high and listen to the dark side of the moon? Well, I've always just focused on the grooves, and I think that genre is um, genre is an affectation. It's just a mask that mm. you wear uh, over the music, and so. If you want to experiment with a genre, you can. It's just it's just a different mediums that you can explore the same thing. And my music has always been rooted in certain principles, namely live performance. Sure. Um, almost all of my albums are recorded live as far as the drummer and the bass player. I so, love hearing that. And uh, the other, and, and I think these are things that when I was a kid and I listened to songwriters from the late 60s and early 70s, there was an aesthetic you particularly would find it maybe with somebody like Jackson Brown. Yeah. People wore, yeah. They wore it like a badge, and yeah. anything less than that was considered not legitimate. And I internalized those messages because. And there's a reason why they said that. They, they said that. It's because music is spiritual, and in order for it to be of the spirit, it has to be connected to the earth. Amen. And so if it's going to be connected to the earth, it has to be 
made with things that are of the earth, which are humanity. It has to have wood and steel, and it has to be done live so that you, the energy translates through the microphone. You know, and so, I, I spent a lot of time, the bands that I loved working with personally more than anything were always progressive rock bands and jam bands. And it was it was because they they maintained something of organicism in what they played live. Um, it, it was not always the same thing. There was always a nuance that was different. There was always something that was different. Um, and Charlie Pelletier, one of our regular listeners, just you know chimed Charlie, in. Charlie. Uh, just just asked. Uh, Charlie does a lot of shows with Susanna Shuffle. Uh, any studio recordings with her already done or in the planning or in the works right now, Charlie Mars? No plans to record with Susanna Shuffle, although I oh. like her and admire her music. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, she is great. I think the first time I saw her was actually at your show at Little Woodrow's last time you were here. Um, but Charlie, who you have met many times, uh, he talks about her constantly. So it was nice to finally get to put a face to the name. She was awesome. Yeah, she's good. She's well, good stuff. And, and that last song, Listen to the Dark Side, like, like you said, is... Um, it's such a familiar call. One of the things you were talking about earlier, and I believe it was before we went on air, uh, was was the concept, or no, it was after we were on air, was the concept of playing colleges uh, and working with jam bands like I did. One of the things that I always tried to instill in them was, please, good God, like communicate with your local college system. Like go play like opening weekend of the college. That kind of stuff. Uh, when you hook people at that age, when you when you get into that mindset of an early twenty, a late teen, um, the the stuff that they listen to at that point is impressed on them when they started to become an individual. You know, and it, it really does uh, with the breadth of your music, especially. I think um, represents something a little bit different. Like one of the bands that. Uh, was popular and started to become popular right up around the time that Julie and I were in college. Julie, my wife, and I all went to the same college in Irving, Texas, University of Dallas, was the old 97s. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they came and played, like, the the music on the mall and stuff like that. And they came and played, like, UD Festival and yeah, that kind crazy. of stuff. Yeah, it's crazy. I still am and, in touch with Rip because and, we've yeah. known him since he was... Yeah, and, you know, it's, it's one of those things of, like, yeah, you know, whenever you talk about things like totally the wet sprocket uh you know that kind of stuff it's it's definitely that um college feel that that idea of just starting to discover yourself um how much of your music do you think has to do with discovery charlie i don't know i mean <laughs> I think I've, I've always been on on a journey to try to understand things and and most of my music is is about a failure to connect and how painful that is, whether it's the loss of a relationship or okay. things that uh, in life that seem like they promise something and then you experience them and then they leave you unfulfilled. And so I write a lot about that. And then I write a lot about my solutions for that, which are commune with nature and friendships and 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 a spiritual life yes and uh, you you'd mentioned earlier uh the concept of uh being communal and and communing with people uh where where does that fall in your daily life in in as much as you travel uh because it, like you said earlier uh for a musician uh, who works as much as you do, uh, being on the road easily a hundred days a year, um, it can be hard to make roots. It can be hard to make friends. It can be hard, like you said earlier, to know who to trust on the regs whenever you're in town. You know what I mean? Like who's out for your vested interest and who's out to make sure that like you're, you're there for the best reasons, you know, uh, how did that come about for you? Um, well, I, 
it is tough to maintain healthy relationships when you do what I do for a living. Indeed. And and so I I think because of that I am very aware of how nice it is when I get to have a healthy connection with a group of people and how nice it is when I'm not um living in an isolated situation and I'm getting to to share my energy with everyone else and they're doing the same and, and it's just it's a, it's a healing thing to do that and if you live in that isolated place all the time you're gonna go crazy you know you can't do that so um music has always been my connection and and i mean part of it is this like i'm kind of a chicken shit so like, i don't <laughs> sure. i don't connect with that many people and it's because I'm a sensitive person and I just tend to not be around that many people. But sure. I also have that hunger for the opposite of that. And that has always been satisfied through performance of songs and, and getting to connect with my fans and my audience. And, you know, I always hated, I don't like collectivism. So I don't like clubs. I don't like yeah. teams. I don't like. I, I don't I've always been a very mistrustful person of 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 the mob. Yeah, the large group I, mentality. Yeah, and so I've always lived and existed outside of that and I think that my music is a reflection of that and ultimately it's all roots music. It's just roots music and it's the explorations of that. I think on the left you have like Bill Withers who is an acoustic groove based songwriter. Totally. And on the right, you have Willie Nelson. And I think that my music falls in that spectrum. And it seems like it's really diverse, but I always saw it as one thing, which is an exploration of roots music and what that means to do it. And to me, when it was great, it was done poetically and it was done simply. And it was done it was, it was with a literary mindset mm -hmm. because all the people that I loved did that. Yeah. And I think that that's less uh, of a badge of honor in all music now, but I've never let go of that because it is the hallmark of good music that stands the test of time. Absolutely. And and so that's what I see it all as. That's well, that's how I connect, and that's how I see where my music falls. And see, as as an audio engineer, as someone who spent time on the other side of the audience from you, um, it was always musicians like you, uh, sounds like you that resonated through the audience, uh, that, that that were so truly honest and un unpresupposing to what they were, that uh, that they actually like just carried through the audience like like an energy vibe it was absolutely amazing and something that you brought up a while ago was the fact that you're really a personal person you don't you don't enjoy the crowds like i to me the clubs were a means to an end as an audio engineer um you know like they they were a necessity uh given given my daily atmosphere i would prefer like not to be in that aspect typically i'm the opposite um, i love lots like, of people around me all the and, time and uh, you know like it it just well, became no, I, I there was I like being in, it, yeah i like clubs i like a crowd of live music I, yes I, just meant, I don't i don't like a mob mentality no so i've always i've always lived outside of that yes and and that's the thing is like whenever i was at work whenever i'm behind a soundboard whenever i'm working like i love it there's nothing like it same thing with being on stage there's nothing like it but for me to go out on a Thursday night, I'm hard pressed to go out to a venue and be around a crowd of 300 people. You know, well, like that's I feel, I feel you on that. Like yeah, that's I'm, that's I'm, not necessarily what I'm looking for I in my downtime. You know, like Julie's out love and about people. all the time. Like she is. Uh, for me, whenever I'm working, whether it's doing a live dudes and beer with a hundred something people, or out at Meekum with thousands of people, or doing the corporate AV that I do, like. I, I've got my blinders on, like I'm in my zone, you know, like I am I am utterly in my atmosphere and cool with it. Uh, but for me to just go out and hang out around like 
a, a thousand people at South by or something like that at a show, like it can be a little tough, uh, to, to just deal with that vibe of energy and to be around that many people. This is true. Speaking of crowds of people wanting to know things about you, uh, my friend Chris Jameson asks what your favorite Bob Dylan song is. Oh. My favorite? First of all, I don't like Bob Dylan that much. Oh! <laughs> awesome. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> um, but second of all, I'd have to say... Um, tangled Up in Blue. Nice. That that is personally my favorite Bob Dylan song as well. Uh, yeah, I do like that song. But all, all in all, I, like, I think Bob Dylan's a dick. <laughs> Fair enough. Have you met him? No, I just think the way he's carried himself throughout his career has been unemotional and standoffish. And I have a theory a that he's through. dead. And he just oh. seems like a selfish dickhead you know what's funny is one of my favorite rock and roll stories in the world is like about four years ago bob dylan was actively arrested for vagrancy outside of madison square garden before his show uh (laughs) like he was there and but he probably wasn't because i'm pretty sure he's dead like you know he was just he was walking around like bob dylan like beat up sweatpants and a torn up t-shirt with like you know faded out colors and stuff and the police thought that he was a homeless person and just thought he was a vagrant he was like no i'm bob dylan yeah sure you are buddy all right you know, and they, yeah, they hauled him off. I, I, I think Bob Dylan is very talented, and he's obviously an intelligent guy, and he's a great wordsmith. But he lacks the heart that some of the artists that I've liked, in my opinion, have. Yeah. And uh, and that's why he leaves him. So I'm ambivalent about him, and I don't really give a shit about Bob Dylan. That's okay. That's Rock fair. Him. Who are some of your favorites then? Yeah, Neil Young. Bruce Springsteen, All Jackson right. Brown, cool. Van Morrison. Um, I love a lot of 80s stuff, like college music, like R.E.M. and The Violent Film. Sweet. Pixies totally. And Smiths and The Cure. And then I got into a lot of jam. I liked Widespread Panic early on. And Hell yes. I loved a lot of country stuff. I mean, Jay Farrar is one of my all-time favorites. Uh, songwriters um, he was so good in Uncle Tupelo yeah and um, I haven't been as big a fan of Wilco as I was of Uncle Tupelo but and they're, they're good and they have they're very they push the boundaries a lot but uh, um, and then guys that are currently out there are like Ron Sexsmith I think is wonderful uh, Rufus Wainwright Ryan right. Adams is talented. Yeah. Um, John Fulbright. Uh, Bob Schneider is a friend of mine. I think he's great. And Griffin House is a friend of mine. I think he's great. You know, I like emotion and I like vulnerability and I like simple poetry. And so, you know, if it doesn't have those elements, I pretty much like it. Steer away from it. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, if it doesn't tune in, then you tune out. Amen. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and coming back full circle, uh, let's talk about the album Beach Town, because um, it's... When when is the official release date for Beach Town? I don't have one. Okay. (laughs) But it's going to probably be uh, May... All right. Okay. All, all right. That, all that'll be decided in the next few weeks, but I don't have an official release date. Yet. Well, okay. you can definitely come back on and, and promote it. When yeah, yeah. Run. Whenever, whenever you yeah. have an official yeah. release date, please do let us know. Yeah. We'd love to have you yeah. on and talk speci- specifically about that album and go into a lot more detail about it uh, and the creation right of it, things like that. Um, but moving right along, uh, where? Where were you uh, life, life-wise? life uh, Where were you personally when you began writing the album Beach Town? And what what inspired not only the name, but the, the overall feeling of this album? 
I've been writing songs in Nashville, trying to make a second career as a, as just a full time songwriter, and I was having a hard time breaking through into that. And I had written all these songs with people that, and and I'd probably written uh, 250 songs. And uh, but I, there was a there was some of them really connected with me, and were also songs that I felt like they were personal, um, even though I had written them with someone else. And so I decided to, I, I was going down to this beach town in, on, the, on the Gulf Coast of Florida. and and Which town is that? You might not want to say. an area <laughs> called Highway 30A. It's a, kind right. of a, com- it's a, it's a group of, of like six or seven different small communities. Okay on this one highway and my friend from that I've known forever, he's loaded and he has a big beach house and he's been cool enough to let me go stay there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and I was going down there in the off season in the winter time and riding and um I I met some people that I really connected with and they turned me on to some some sort of uh <sighs> They're kind of extreme athletes, and I I got invested in in ice submersion and running barefoot. Oh and wow! Really just on a myriad of behaviors that were about connecting with not only nature but connecting with yourself. Yeah, no, yeah, like your your utter interior endurance and and what you can withstand personally. Very little for me. <laughs> exactly, and and. I continued to ice, use ice submersion as a form of meditation for the last year and a half. And wow. When I first got into it there. And, um, and, and really the lesson for me was just simply that I believe that for happiness for people on this planet, you need to find community. Yeah. And you need to connect. You need to, I needed to connect with nature and 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 surrender myself to to that experience and there weren't a lot of people around and so all the tourists were gone and i had an opportunity to be in the waves and be on the beach and not be distracted by shiny objects or the need to you know go do things that were a distraction yes and yes. What, what i got from that over time was a philosophy of life really that modern life is way off track and in order to balance that if you want to be happy and healthy there's things you can do and they're not easy and they're no. painful yep and comfort is 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 actually killing us yeah because because you just want to be comfortable all the time and you're going to turn into a soft pathetic mess <laughs> And I don't, and I wanted to push myself to see what was beyond my comfort. Well, and what I found is that all growth is involves pain. Yes. And all birth involves pain. And new versions of self involve a shedding of an old self, which is painful. Yeah. And sometimes the catalyst for that new self is to face pain. And so pushing myself out in nature away from climate controlled environments and artificial lighting being and and in the the universe which is what we're meant to be and what we're designed to be it reconnected me with my authentic self and it gave me a way to to manage my life on a day-to-day basis that didn't involve um impulse satisfaction Yes. To survive. So whether that's a cigarette or whether it's uh, hard drugs or whether it's spending money or whether it's yeah. sex or whether it's gambling or whether it's a desire for ego based things. Over the last few years, and it's been a long, long, long journey for me, but I've really turned a new page as far as being able to find some internal. Um, serenity through those activities and so Good. you know you think beach town you think oh, that's probably about some bitchy shit and you drink some margaritas and we go party like Jimmy yeah. Buffett or something <laughs> but, and that's, that's 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 certainly part of it you know? sure I mean, sure I, but it's beach it's, town in the winter like, time I, I like serious things hey it's just music and it's supposed to 
I like to, it's fun, and I want it to be, the, you know, a, on a craft level, the best I can do, and I don't want to, I'm not here to, like, you know, drag anybody down, but underneath, no. underneath these things that are fun and that are commercial and that are carefree, I want to have a, something that means something, and yeah. my philosophy is that that is the philosophy of the record, is that it's about you know, keeping things organic in a digital world, you know, and, and and staying away from all the shiny objects that will distract you from what it is. I, and connected life. I could not agree with you more uh, philosophically or theologically, my friend. Um, quite honestly, I, I spent the first year of my college career in the seminary uh, studying to be a priest and living the aesthetic life, living living that concept of um, doing doing what is right for you, doing doing what's uh, trying to keep um, a spiritual level on things instead of a physical level is utterly important in life in general. And I think we as a society have kind of lost sight of that. Uh, we've we've gotten into and we have this discussion on dudes and beer all the time about how society has become this concept of immediacy. Um, we've lost the idea of putting effort into something or seeing a two three year plan, you know uh, that kind of stuff. We've we've really lost the idea of the virtue of patience um, and really well, working on we're something. All just- flawed human beings oh, are absolutely. Yeah, sure. um, at the mercy of television yeah. and the media and phones and technology. Could and not agree more. Our te- technology has evolved past what our DNA was meant for. And although yeah. a lot of these inventions are amazing, on one hand, just from a technological standpoint, when it comes to how good is this for humanity, uh, I think we're only at the beginning of starting to understand whether it's good for humanity or not. And my Absolutely. feeling is that it's not. Yeah. My feeling is that I was much happier in a world where we wrote letters. You know, you had one phone at the house that you yes. had to, you know, fight, fight for your siblings <laughs> to use. Get well, no, I mean, head. even tonight, even tonight, I asked Julie, like, does he have a landline that we can call into? And I laughed and I said, I don't think that exists uh, anymore. You know, like, <laughs> uh, most people don't have a landline anymore. I do miss letters. Yeah. I've only got two Christmas cards yeah. this year. No, letters are like, it, it, they're a huge thing. They're very important. And it's one of those, like, I think we have created amongst um, social media, things like that, this concept of an immediate society. And not only that, but the concept of an obscured society where we think what we say in public is private. Yeah, I don't think people understand, especially and people, how far-reaching things can get. It's, it's hard in that obfuscated world uh, to be an honest musician. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's it's it's, it's, every, it's a challenge, but you know, life life is suffering, and so if you can reduce that suffering, you're doing good. But mm-hmm. it's always going to be suffering, and yeah. And I think that the technology has only added to the suffering. I don't. I think that the vast majority of this stuff that we're all caught up in is is nothing but a shiny object. And Absolutely. It at the end of it all, it meant nothing. And no matter, it, it, but basically. To me, if it's on a screen, it pretty much means nothing. Yeah. Because the loss of that organic connection, even if it's a book and it's on paper and it's on wood from the from the earth, it's it has a spirituality to it. And sure. to me it's all about that. And the reason why I'm so I'm so caught up in that is because I know what it's like to be so far away from that and I know what how much it hurts to be cut off from from a healthy spiritual existence and yeah. and I think that we're a world of distraction and it's only getting worse and worse and worse but at the same time humanity always has this way of riding the ship and so I, I think that over time we'll realize that that people's lives are just kind of 
becoming this constant distraction because yeah. we're all kind of cowardly and fearful and no one wants to actually deal with not the, themselves the reality. Yeah. And, and their relationships of, with their family and their children yeah. and their parents and, and then their co-workers and on to having causes that they're passionate about and believe in that affect the world. I, what I see is that we're all in a, in like we're in the matrix and that we're all just sort of feeding the, this, these sort of like invisible beings at the top of the pyramid that are sucking us and all And you are so dry. perfect for this show. I can't even tell you. Chris is just over here <sighs> eating up every word that you're saying. Right now, uh, yeah, I mean. This go, is like literally what most of our shows are about. Go, go listen to Thinking Deeply sometime. <laughs> uh, this is exactly what it's about. He's it's like absolutely shaking over true. here. He's so excited. Because, I mean, people don't understand that there is... There is a spiritual awakening that happens within yourself when you actually start to um, lose yourself, when you start to do things for the betterment of other people, when you start to do things sans ego, um, you know, even let's, even let's as... break it down. Yeah. What is God? God is love. What is love? Love is openness. And if you're open... You're connected to everything. So the more open you are, the more connected you are. The more isolated and shut down and in the self you are, the less open you are, which means the less loving you are, which means the less godlike you are. Exactly. And that's it. Yeah. It's not complicated. It's very no. simple, although it's very complicated. And it takes a lot of courage to do those. Things. Well, and, and it goes it goes into that. spirituality and not religion, and that's that's where most people get the two confused. Um, one does not necessarily have to do with the other, um, and living a spiritual life does not necessarily mean that you live a religious life. Uh, most people I've found that live a spiritual life are much more uh, like you, Charlie, where they are um, in tune with themselves as, as artists. Uh, they understand their connection with themselves, with the world around them, with what they are sp supposed to resonate for the good of other people, um, things like that, you know, and uh, yeah, I mean. There's an awakening happening. I see it happening. Oh, I yeah. Think the pendulums, I think that people are getting burned out on pop culture and they're, yep. they're getting burned out on, on screens and they miss the the earth and they miss the connection with the their disillusion is definitely starting to happen people are becoming disillusioned they're, they're tired of watching their look like you know uh, everything's a fashion spread and once it's a fashion spread whether it's yep. the oysteria and the James Beard award winning chefs or, sure. or this guy who makes custom engraved guns in rural South Carolina like I think that once it becomes a fashion spread, it's a way of stealing the soul of it. Absolutely. And so I'm sick of I'm sick of a fashion spread world, and I think that it's all going to come crumbling down, and I can't wait. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Ready you to know, say goodbye to that it's, Pinterest it's, board. It's, it's it's almost one of those things of like you literally see it happening before your eyes, and you just get, it's it's one of those face and palm moments where you're like. Good God, how can people just not see this? Uh, how can they not see it in front of them? Uh, you know, um, even because even, we're we will do anything to run from our fear. Yeah, and if something makes the fear go away, we do it. We're that's that simple. True that. And pop and, and trivial reality shows and computers and phones and Instagrams and and uh, Snapchats and, and everything. They, yeah, all it does is just distract you, and it takes away your the fact that you're going to die. Well, and <laughs> you know, as as someone who myself <laughs> um, dealt uh, not only dealt with that fact, but dealt <laughs> dealt with the fact of um, heart addiction at one point in life. Um, you really do come to an understanding of uh, the base raw reality of things with that when you when you finally kind of. Uh, just stop and turn point and go, why the hell am I doing this? Like this, this is the most horrifying, selfish thing in the world. Like, what have I been doing? 
Um, where does that fall in the way that you view things, Charlie? Well, everybody has to bottom out on, on the prison of self in sure. order to escape it. And so, you know, Buddha didn't wind up underneath the tree overnight. You know, you have to go on a journey of self-discovery. And you have to, I've had to do it. And I've, yeah. had, to, I've had to realize things that d didn't work. And for me, I'm stubborn. And so I had to be, no one could tell me I wanted to go out and taste it for myself. Yeah. And so if you're lucky, you survive all that. And you, you, you walk through layers of karma along the way and then you, 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 you realize that you have to find a balance between the ego and the collective unconscious and you have to serve that balance. Yeah. I, I couldn't have put that more specifically uh, because it really is a karmic point of view and understanding the fact that you have put things out there, you have done things and anything that you can do uh, to, to write that, to, to make that point understood. And even Charlie Pelletier, once again, just chimed in, totally agree with what Charlie and Chris are talking about with regard to technology. An old professor of mine always said technology is the downfall of Western civilization. That was the early 90s when none of this smartphone, social media existed. Well, Seems he may have been it's correct. It's a fine line with the downfall of civilization because with technology also comes amazing scientific discoveries and medical discoveries, which you can't, those are good. Um, but yeah, people need to like put the Snapchat filters down and, well, and show who they really are in the world in a personal way. I think what Charlie is talking about is really, really the idea, like we've talked about so many times, where people somehow think that their public page is private. Um, they they somehow well, it's an accurate reflection of who you are. Which exactly. Nobody's Snapchat or Facebook no. or Twitter is actually who they are. It's no. like who you want to present yourself to be for thirty five yeah, seconds. Yeah, it's of it's day. the total it's the total Chris Rock concept of the first six months you're dating a representative. <laughs> yeah. Um, like My that Facebook is page is that is your digital like, representative. Also, all I do on you it know. is like hang out with cool people and buy stuff. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, exactly. That's five percent or less of my life. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it is something interesting, like Charlie was saying, um, to to get to the point where you start to see the world the way it is, to start to um, even even see uh, artistic consumption and things like that the way it is, for the reality that it is, and to strip away illusion, because um, as someone who's who's dealt with that world, you really do have to learn to strip illusion from reality and really get to, like, base realities in order to uh, further yourself as a person, even as an artist, you know, uh, where did you come to realize that, Charlie? Hey, hey. Alcoholics Anonymous. Ah, right Good on. Good for when you. I, when I went there and I, I heard some guy talking about what a horrible person he had been and he was being honest about himself. Yeah. And I saw it. And we were all laughing and crying and and it felt so real and I thought, Wow, I didn't really know this was an option. You can just kinda just tell the, tell truth. the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And and what I realized is the truth is what brings people together. Yeah. And it's an illusion that you brought together with someone by putting on a good front. Yeah. And AA was where I got my uh, really everything that I do as far as on stage is about um, pulling the saying something whether I think it's politically correct if I think it's true then I embrace it and 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 the, the, the power that is unleashed by by not hiding the human aspects of yourself because the human beings are meant to be flawed absolutely and so why are we all running around trying not to be yeah why are we you all know, putting on the illusion of perfection <laughs> yeah and so i i learned that from aa and that's where I, I learned pretty much that that people are just putting on a show yeah. and everybody's doing it and i don't have to yeah, and it's my it's my show and it's my stage. And if you can, if you want to pay to come see it, 
you're going to see somebody who doesn't give a fuck. Yeah. Um, I get the only thing I care about is the truth. And, 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 and I, and I love wit and sarcasm, but I think that they're also can be destructive. So sure. I try to make sure that I temper that with, with letting my audience know that it's all done with a wink and a nod, you know, yeah. I'm mm-hmm. not, yeah. you are an I'm excellent not a storyteller. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. There you go. So, <laughs> you know, I would say that, yeah. And then uh, that planted the seed and I, I think that a lot of areas of my life have really become like that, and I'm, and I'm the man doesn't own me. Nobody owns me. Good for you, so Charlie. I don't have to. Good I don't have you. to play to any any party line, and I paid a price for that. But but the good part of it is I don't have to say anything just because someone thinks I should say it or mm-hmm. thinks it's not right or whatever. I don't care. Yeah, and I think that the world is, is only been improved by people who feel that way. Absolutely, because it, uh, to me, it's that it's that unbridled reality um, and that realization of self, um, that realization of not just self but self limitation, um, and and uh, the that combined with uh, what artists have to say. I think, uh, really provides a different point of view uh, than what the average person sees on a daily basis. Uh, Explain to us, tell us a little bit about um, the upcoming album Beach Town once again and the last track, track 12, Mountain Girl, off of the album and how that relates to what you're talking about. That song is just uh, it's about a girl that I was in love with and how painful it was to lose that. And uh, I was I was down at the beach um, trying to get over that, um, or at least uh, yeah. And then um, it's just about that. Okay. And she she was from the mountains, and. Um, and I spent a lot of time there with her in the mountains. And so right. it, was, uh, it was just kind of a, an ode to, to heartbreak. And, and also, um, I, it has that line in it. It says, when did you start reading books? You should call it the wine club. <laughs> and instead of, you know, like girls go to their book club and they don't read the books. Right, they just yeah, just yes. drinking wine. And I always loved... That idea that um, that to yeah that that was just something that that I noticed about that there's so many things in life that are like oh this is just a good excuse to get fucked up sure <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. And, and that's fine. I mean, we all like to look. Everything I'm talking about, I'm also well aware that human beings need a break from reality, and they mm-hmm. need a break from uber consciousness. And that's obviously a part of our DNA. And I embrace that. I really yeah. do. And I've embraced that plenty in my life. Too much, probably. <laughs> so I don't <laughs> throw stones at people who want to escape for a little while. It's just simply. Sure. Um, it shouldn't be a way of life. Yeah, yeah, and and to what and, extent uh, and to what sacrifice? Yeah, and but but that song in particular is just about heartbreak and missing okay. somebody and but it's also and how super hard that clever. is. To, you know somebody and you know their family and you know their tics and you and you one day you're just a stranger to all of that. Yeah, and that's what it's about. Well, let's take a listen to. Once again, the last track off of the upcoming album Beach Town uh, by Charlie Mars, Mountain Girl, right here on the Dudes and Beer podcast. She said it's my first night in Austin, Texas. And I don't know how I got here And we danced in the 
loving places to the loving places disappear when did you start reading books you should call it the wine club all the boys are lined up to be drinking with you I'm gonna find me a girl on a train with a dragon tattoo to take away this pain until it's gone girl and I never coming back to you talk again gonna miss those trees Gonna miss them valleys Gonna miss those Leaves in the fall Gonna miss your father Gonna miss your brother Gonna miss my mountain girl Most of all When did you start reading books? You should call it the wine club All the boys will line up To be drinking with you I'm gonna find me a girl on a train With a dragon tattoo To take away this pain Until it's gone, girl And I never coming back to you And you can find me where there's only two tracks. Uh, Charlie, yeah, I would have to say that this this song in particular for the wrap up of this album is fantastic. Uh, what brought you to bring this as the final song in the new album Beach Town? Because I just need guitar and what I'm best at, which is lyricism and a classicist sensibility and is a live performance with just it's with one microphone and I wanted to after a whole album of full band material and you know a lot of big production and everything I wanted to to make sure that I ended with what I began with in my life which is which is that I'm just a craftsman, and all I ever wanted to be was a great craftsman. Not a good one, but a great one. Yeah. And I've spent my whole life trying to do that, and I could spend the rest of my life probably trying to continue to grow at it. And it's the most important. It's my passion. And so that song is just sort of a... It's a... I think it's a representation of, so far, the best that I can do. And I think it is a fantastic representation of uh, not just songwriting, but honesty as a person. Um, Like you said, trying to um, bring the point home of understanding yourself, knowing yourself. Um, That's really, the to me, the end-all, be-all of music is really and truly getting in touch with that vibration that you have in the world around you, um, with the way that you relate to the world around you, and uh, how your emotions ripple into the world around you. Uh, Stephen Bishop... My co-host What's has just up, joined guys? us, so uh, <laughs> welcome. Yeah. Welcome. He has, been, he has been tuning in Sliding on via in. distance, <laughs> but uh, just joined us, Charlie. Yeah. So uh, yeah. what would you like to ask of Charlie Mars as far as the creation of his music, stuff like that, Stephen? Oh, I'd like to know, like, what's his, uh, what's his inspiration? And, 
you know, uh, what's his go-to um, for, you know, the creation of his music, you know. Uh, I know everybody's got, like, something different to say, you know, and, and everybody's got their own thing and stuff. But what's, the, I guess, the greatest inspiration, you know? Neuroses. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can relate. It's a, that's a great way to put that. Um because because it is uh not just what you worry about in the world, but you know, and how you like you said a while ago with Mountain Girl, uh how you relate to the world around you, you know? Um what your internal conflict is. Yeah. Yeah, that's what neuroses is. It's unresolved internal energy. Yeah, and I think that that's where all the songs are inspired by. Yeah, and you have a great breadth as a musician, as far as uh, not just style but content, Charlie. Uh, where do you draw your influences from, as far as songwriting and musicianship? Well, songwriting, I draw it from a lot of the people that we talked about. And I was an English major in college, and I studied romantic poetry for three years, and I learned a lot from some very bright people. And they sort of set a bar for me that I wanted to carry into writing songs. And I certainly fall short of that a lot, but there's been times when I feel like I haven't. And when I don't fall short, it really makes everything else worth it. So... You know, I'm, I'm serious about writing fucking songs. Yeah. I mean, it's not a joke. No, for sure. No, no, and that's and just so, it. And, and so I treat it with a great deal of respect because it's the one area of my life where I have had a lot of integrity. And, 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 I'm, and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful to have had something that I could control that it's integrity because... The human, the human experience is often seems to be out of control. Indeed. So, m- music is is this way of harnessing your life and your emotions into something that is that is not chaos. Yeah, it it is definitely a a, a, a means by which to quell oneself, um, to, to, uh, get rid of and filter a lot of thinking and a lot of the way that we process the world around us. I know that's like my Um, best music. It comes from experiences, you know, um, a lot of it might be hurt or like something I've gone through that hurt me or something, but, um, it comes out through the music and it's like... Oh, go ahead, yeah, when you're hurt, it causes energy to be blocked. That's the definition of hurt. You know, yeah. To become unhurt, you have to free that energy. Yeah, and makes sense. That's essentially what songs and art can do. They can free those those energies that are stuck in there. Absolutely, it's like, it's like tapping into the river. Yeah, and and that is a great way to put it, Charlie. And that's like when you know, like people are singing things. I mean, you can tell when something's genuine, you know, almost, you know, like, and, and when it's genuine, and I mean, people can feel that, you know. Yeah, and Charlie definitely has a good knack for people feeling his genuine self when he performs and even just listening to the CDs um, and we have kept you for a long time today Charlie yeah. where do people go so that they can experience this in person or online or yeah. like this is your moment plug yourself oh I've got charliemars.com and I have Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and I'm easy to find I'm always touring and um, I'm always around Texas and so if someone's interested they don't have to look too far to figure it out yeah, it's it is readily available, folks. Not just that, but make sure to go to dudesandbeer dot com. We have all of his stuff linked there. Sure do. Everything else, uh, we will be posting this episode here in the next little bit. Uh, yeah. Charlie, we can't thank you enough for coming on the show, uh, talking about Beach Town, everything else. I know that you have an upcoming release date in mind. It's still in the works, stuff like that. But as it comes closer, please do keep in touch with us. We would love to talk with you about it. 
Uh, love to be a part of that promo push and help you get the word out there as much as possible. For sure. Because we absolutely love the music and the uh, words of Charlie Mars here on the Dudes and Beer podcast. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely, for on, man. Charlie. Anytime. Oh, yeah. uh, thank you so much for tuning in tonight and for being part of the podcast tonight, Charlie. Uh, we can't yeah. thank you enough. Uh, once again, everybody, please go to charliemars.com to not only buy the music of Charlie Mars, but to check out the latest info. And go see him on Saturday at Saxon go, Pub. Go see nice. him this Saturday at Saxon Pub oh, here in Austin, Saxon. Texas. Until next time, everybody, please check us out on the HC Universal Network, hcuniversalnetwork.com. Until then, happy holidays, everybody. Yeah. And if yeah. you can't be good, be, be good, good at it. it. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Dudes and Beer Podcast. To listen to our audio streams and chat with us live, download the official Dudes and Beer app for both Android and iDevices available on the Google Play and iTunes markets. For more episodes, content, and information, visit us online at dudesandbeer.com. You can also find our episodes on Spreaker, SoundCloud, YouTube, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast service. Thanks for listening, everybody. And until next time, drink responsibly.